doesn't depend on concentration gradient. It depends on free energy gradient. So this is the gradient of the chemical potential. If I multiply these two, that's again joules per second, energy per second. And when we are deforming something at a steady state, at a steady rate, when you multiply strain rate by the stress, that's the amount of energy per unit time. So it turns out that whenever you can write an equation like this, J is proportional to X. Now this is just an experimental fact. I haven't proved anything. Yeah? I've just given you an equation and said that if I, write, if I can write an equation like this, you will find J is proportional to X. Flux is proportional to the force. So let's try and prove that equation, that J will be proportional to X. And the way we will prove it is we take a flux, which is a function of a force, and we do a Taylor expansion. Okay. So ignore this part and just focus over here. A Taylor expansion is simply saying that, look, I can write this function as a combination of a number <coughs> of terms. And the first term here is the flux when the force is zero. <coughs> This is the uh, derivative of the flux with respect to x, and this is the force, second derivative, with an x squared upon 2. Now, how can I simplify this equation? Okay, so this is the flux being expanded as a series of terms. Can you look at this equation and tell me if any of the terms disappear? Somebody said something, which is correct. <laughs> yeah? yeah. You see, the flux, when the force is zero, must be zero. If you don't have any gradient of temperature, you won't get any heat flux. Yeah? So this term will disappear. What other simplification can I make? Yeah? We can ignore high order terms, because we have x squared and if x is less than 1, then, you know, these will be smaller than this, yeah? So if I do that, I can get rid of that term and that term, and I find that the flux is proportional to the force. J is proportional to x. Now, the important thing about this is that we only obtain that result by ignoring high-order terms. Those terms might become important when the force becomes large. So the theory that we, have, we are using will only apply when you are a small distance away from equilibrium. Okay. If you are very far from equilibrium, this theory will not work. So supposing you apply a very, very large voltage, then it may be that the current will not be proportional to the voltage. Ohm's law may not work. Similarly, if you have a very, very large gradient of free energy, okay, then maybe the diffusion flux will not be proportional to that. And in fact, that is the case, that at very large gradients, Fix's law no longer applies. And the diffusion coefficient becomes a function of the gradient itself. Now, I can't tell you how far we can deviate from equilibrium. I can't say, look, if my force becomes bigger than this, then this equation no longer applies. I need to um, do an experiment to find out when the law will break down. Okay. Because this is empirical. Uh, now, of course, I can generalize this if I have more than one process happening. For example, if I have diffusion of solute happening both in a concentration gradient and a temperature gradient, then I can write the total free energy being dissipated as a function of several of these terms. So I can have multiple dissipations happening. So let's imagine that we have both carbon and manganese gradients. Okay. Then the flux of carbon will not only be a function of the gradient of carbon, but also a function of the gradient of manganese. 
So if I have a constant carbon composition for the gradient of manganese, then the carbon will diffuse. Okay. And this is how computer programs like Dictra work, where they have multi-component diffusion. And you can see that you find equations like these in the papers and textbooks, where the flux of one element also depends on the gradient of another element. Okay. Now, all of you, at some stage, have used a thermocouple. Yeah. And it's an amazing piece of equipment, if you think about it. You are producing a voltage difference by measuring a temperature difference. Okay. So the temperature difference is producing a voltage difference. That comes from this theory. That look, the, the flow of current depends on the temperature gradient as well as on the voltage difference. Yeah. So the opposite is the Peltier effect, where when you pass a current, you produce a temperature difference. So you know, in Taiwan probably, certainly in Taiwan, but also in Britain, you can buy a solid state refrigerator, a small refrigerator for one can, where you know you pass a current and there are no moving parts, but you produce a temperature difference. Okay, you refrigerate your drink. And that is comes from these equations. Of course, it didn't come from these equations. Someone invented it first. But nevertheless, that's the theory. Uh, okay, I won't go into this in detail. I'm now going to go on to some examples. Right? In real life, where a combination of different methods has been used to make calculations, predict things, and then do the experiments. And one of the most complicated phenomena in material science is value. You have every aspect of metallurgy comes in there. And you have the arc physics, you have solidification, solid state transformations, mechanical properties, and large structures. And I showed you this slide earlier, and this is a very deceptive slide. It's too simple. In fact, there are so many phase transformations that happen in iron okay, that it is an incredibly complicated substance. Not even in just pure iron, you can get body-centered cubic ferrite, you can get face-centered cubic austenite, hexagonal close back to iron, you can get tetragonal iron and trigonal ion, five different crystal structures. Each of those crystal structures has magnetic properties. If I start to add elements, I can get thousands of other phase transformations. Um, then we make, out of the material, very large engineering structures. Uh, this is an oil rig in the North Sea. The North Sea is one of the most hostile environments. You, know, you get wave height of 50 meters. It is salty water, so it corrodes the steel. And the temperature can be close to zero degrees centigrade. And this is a very, very large structure. And the whole thing is welded together. Uh, not only that, but supposing you design your steel, nobody will buy it if it is expensive. And the cost of the steel used in that oil rig is 10,000 times cheaper than the cost of potato crisps of the same weight. Yeah? So it's no use if you say, look, I'm going to make this out of carbon nanotubes. If the carbon nanotubes, you know, one gram of it costs an enormous amount to produce. You've got to design an alloy which is cheap as well as all those engineering properties. But to make the situation even worse, you not only create the best quality of metal, but then you put a defect in it. Okay? And that defect is called welding. Yeah, you, you go to a lot of trouble to produce fantastic steel. And then you melt regions, you heat effect regions. Welding is basically putting a defect in order to join things together produce an inhomogeneous microstructure and so forth. 
So the kind of science that goes into this is just unbelievable. Yeah. You know, we, we are doing, doing things which the ordinary person doesn't realize because we do them so well. Okay, but they are very, very complicated things and you should be very proud of what you are doing. Yeah. Just to give you another example, <coughs> this is an oil pipeline. In, in very, very cold condition. And again, this is all welded. If a crack starts on this, it can propagate for kilometers. Yeah. And imagine the environmental disaster you would have if that happens. And this has happened in Russia, you know, where the crack propagated for kilometers in Siberia. So if you don't do your job properly, we will have big trouble. And of course, you are very familiar with this, yeah? the 101 tower. And I don't suppose you have been to the top as yet. Yeah? But uh, I have a friend who is going to take me to the top of this tower on uh, Saturday or Friday? Tomorrow. Friday. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So, I would to go to <laughs> so I'm privileged. But you know, there's a lot of steel here. And it has been joined together. Yeah? And this is in an earthquake zone. Yeah, you recently had a typhoon and it didn't do any damage to this tower. So the level of engineering and metallurgy that goes into these things is incredibly high. Much, much more complicated than computers. After all, how many times does your computer crash or freeze up or do something silly? Okay. If something like that happened with an oil rig or a pipeline, we would have big disasters. So engineers are much better trained than computer people. They produce structures which are reliable. Okay. Whereas, you know, in, your, in the case of your computer, you have to reboot everything. <laughs> so imagine if you had to reconstruct this building. Yeah. That's the analogy that Bill Gates needs to understand. You know, he needs the discipline of engineering. Okay, now, given the complexity of the problem, we are going to say that, look, we can first do a calculation and then you can make this building. So that is a very courageous statement to make, okay? Given that our theory, you know, is not so good. We don't even know whether the polynomial equation will work in certain regions of space. So, this is a conservative set of variables when you are doing a welding experiment. You have a chemical composition which has many different elements, some of which are in parts per million concentration, but are important. Okay. Some of them are impurities. Uh, your steel will have undergone very complicated processing. Uh, you then have to have a welding alloy, and there are many different welding processes as well. You know, electron beam, laser, arc welding, and so forth. And then you might have a heat treatment after that. So any theory that you have, must take account of all the variables. Otherwise, it's not a good theory. Yeah. So, you know, if you give this problem to a physicist, he will first of all reduce the number of variables and say, I'm going to deal with only iron carbon. That's no good. As a material scientist, you can't reduce this problem. You have to deal with all of these variables. And therefore, we have to use shortcuts, which I will show you. I don't want to go into the details of the microstructure, but it's very complicated. Uh, there are layers of ferrite, there is Wiedemann standard ferrite, and this is a good phase which is known as a circular ferrite in the well metal. And the way you would do this calculation is, first of all, the welding process gives you the cooling condition. Okay, so depending on what kind of heat source you have used, what kind of uh, speed you weld with, and so forth, the cooling conditions will depend on your process. So you need to be able to calculate heat flow. Uh, the chemical composition, you can have many, many elements in it. And you need that in order to calculate the phase diagram and kinetics. And you need to be able to predict the solidification structure. So from the composition, you have phase diagrams. You do calculations of time temperature transformation diagrams transformation temperatures, you look at the growth rates of individual phases and how they interact, and eventually you come up with microstructure calculations. 
But an engineer is not interested in the microstructure. What they want is properties. Yeah? Because they design on the basis of properties. It is our job to relate the microstructure to properties. Uh, let me just, first of all, before I go on to properties, explain to you how you can treat more than one phase growing at the same time. Now, the first problem is, let's assume that we have just one phase growing. Okay, let's say, a lochiomorphic ferrite or, or Wiedmann-Stamp ferrite growing. Then, almost 70 years ago, Avrami produced a theory which allows us to calculate the volume fraction of that ferrite as a function of time, temperature. If you have a nucleation rate and if you have a growth rate. So, let me explain to you Avrami theory. Supposing that we are observing our austenite and we form two particles of ferrite here at a time t. And a short time later, those two particles have become bigger. Yeah? So this is the increase in sizes in dark blue. Now during that small increase in time, you might also nucleate new particles. In addition to these particles growing, you might actually nucleate two more particles. Yeah. So we now have four particles. But can you tell me what is wrong with this diagram? This is wrong. But mathematically, I don't know how to say, look, don't form a particle in a region which is not austenite. <coughs> yeah? And Avrami solved this problem by saying that, look, the probability that the particle forms in untransformed austenite is just the volume fraction of that untransformed austenite. So if I add up the dark blue regions here, that gives me the wrong answer, because I'm including this particle, which is not real. Okay. That's the wrong answer. If I multiply it by the probability that new material falls in untransformed austenite, that means the volume fraction of austenite, then that gives me the correct amount of ferrite, which includes this region, this region, and this region, but not this. Okay. So all we are doing is taking this incorrect value, multiplying it by the probability of finding untransformed austenite, and that gives me the true value of ferrite. And if I integrate this equation now, it's a very simple integration, then I can relate the true volume fraction of ferrite to the incorrect volume fraction of ferrite. And that is a Varabi theory. Very beautiful, simple theory, which has been used for 70 years, very successfully. And th this incorrect volume fraction is very easy to calculate if you have a nucleation rate and a growth rate. Now, the only problem with this theory is that it deals with one phase forming at a time. Whereas, in real life, you might have different kinds of phases forming at the same time. So you might have allochiomorphic ferrite, Wiedmann-Sand ferrite, martensite, etc., all at the same time. How can we change this theory to deal with that? Well, it's very simple. If you, if you look at this <coughs> equation here, if I have two phases, alpha and beta, forming together, then I simply need to allow for both those phases in calculating the amount of untransformed austenite. And instead of one equation, I have two equations. And I solve them simultaneously. If I have six phases, I have six different equations and solve them simultaneously. And then you can truly calculate the phases growing together. So you can see alpha and beta are forming at the same time. So we can now deal with many phases forming at the same time. And then you put together all your models, including, you know, thinking about market needs and uh, accountancy and so forth, and you design a well-metal, well but you still need mechanical properties. 
uh, and mechanical properties, things like yield strength, you can calculate using dislocation theory, grain size, whole patch equation, and so forth. But you go to anything complicated, there is nobody in the world who can tell me the Charpy value of a steel as a function of the chemical composition and heat treatment. Nobody in the world can predict it. Nobody can predict the fatigue properties. They can measure them, and they can use them in engineering design, but there's nobody who can predict them. Nobody can even predict the ultimate tensile strength, or the uniform elongation, or the corrosion rate, or the fracture toughness, K1C. So what do you do? You know, you, you give up, basically, and say, we have failed. I mean, after all this research, we cannot predict any of these properties. You can measure them, you can use them in design, but we cannot predict them. So let me show you how to do this now, okay? Uh, we, have to, we have to cheat. And by cheating, I mean we have to use empirical methods. Now, <coughs> supposing that, um, and this brings me on to the subject of neural networks, Supposing that you, you had a complicated problem and you didn't know how to predict it, then the first thing you would do is write an empirical equation like this, a linear regression equation. So here I'm writing the strength as a function of a constant, the carbon concentration, the manganese concentration, the nickel concentration. Linear regression. But then, you know, you go and show this to your boss, and he says, look, uh, I know that there is an interaction between carbon and manganese, which is not in this equation. So you go and derive another equation like this, and you have carbon multiplied by manganese. Now, I don't know whether I should multiply carbon and manganese, or should I divide? Yeah? Should I take the square? I don't know. So it's still unsatisfactory. And, you know, if you have a bad...